Okay, hello everyone. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. For those of you that do not uh, recognize my voice, uh, I'm Pete Bryant and I'm the president of the Society for Radiological Protection. I'd like to start off by welcoming you all to our first ever webinar, which is a big step for us here at SRP. We've had an absolutely amazing response to our webinar program. And I'm pleased to say that we have over 390 attendees registered for this event alone, which is an absolutely fantastic turnout. So a couple of ground rules for today's event. The talk will last for roughly one hour, and I encourage you all to ask questions via the chat function. And for those of you that can't see that on the screen, you should hopefully be able to click on a logo, which is somewhere near the bottom, where you've got your, um, uh, near where you've got a hang up button, and it looks like some speech bubbles with a question mark within it. Uh, Richard will then try and answer as many of those questions at the end of the talk. I also encourage you to submit feedback directly to Charlene, as we want to hear from as many of you as possible. Um, there will be a short survey um, it's sent out to all the attendees at the end of the call, so uh, please just um, give us back your feedback. In particular, we'd like to know what other webinars would you like to see? We have a growing number of webinars coming up, and I would just like to highlight a new one added to the list, which is currently being developed by the Nuclear Industry Association with input from the Society for Radiation Protection. Um, details of that are online within the uh, Nuclear Industry Association's website. So please feel free to join that, which is next week on Tuesday. Lastly, I would like to say a big thank you to Richard uh, and, and Nubia for offering to do this particular webinar on internal dosimetry. With over 35 years of experience in the field, you are in good hands. And on that note, I would like to hand over to Richard to begin the webinar, and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Okay, can you see the uh, slides? Do you want to share them on your screen? If you can go to the Teams app. Hang on a minute. Um, hold on a second, where's that? Share, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I'll just wait for it to. Here we go. Right. I have sent you live, Richard. Okay, fine. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Richard Ball, as you just said. I work for a company called Nuvia, based down at Harwell. And I'm going to spend the next um, hour or so talking about uh, internal dosimetry, uh, the ideal antidote for the uh, lockdown blues. So I'm going to spend the time talking about the basics of internal dosimetry. Uh, and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is run through the sort of essentials of the subject and try to illustrate them by using tritium as a, a simple example so that you can see exactly how the calculations and uh, proceed. So I think most of us are familiar with external dosimetry where the source of radiation is outside the body um, and that's measured with a dose badge as I'm sure you all know but if you get activity inside the body that can be much more difficult to measure. You, you have no in fact no direct means of measuring the dose so you have to use indirect means. A material uh, can get into the body by ingestion, uh, by a wound, um, in the case of something like tritium, by absorption over the intact skin, uh, and the most common route of intake in the occupational field is inhalation. So the important points are that this dose cannot be measured directly, and the dose is received uh, as long as the material is within the body. So quite unlike external radiation, where once you move away from the radiation field, your dose rate drops effectively to zero. With internal contamination, you continue to receive dose um, long after the time of the intake. We have a number of indirect methods um, which we use for um, 
in the internal dosimetry. And the basic strategy is there are three different strategies. Firstly, you can measure activity when it's on its way into the body before it gets there, and that's by air sampling. And you can have either personal air samplers or static air samplers. The next strategy is that you can measure the activity once it's in the body via in vivo monitoring, and you can monitor the whole body, the lung or the wound site. Or you can measure activity when it's coming out of the body by doing measurements on urine and feces. Now, air sampling is a more or less uh, straightforward model independent method of measuring, estimating an intake. Um, but the other two methods, in vivo monitoring and excre excretion monitoring, require some sort of mathematical model in order to relate intake to what you see either in the body or in the urine and feces. OK, before we go any further, let's introduce some of the in dosimetry quantities that are used in internal dosimetry. I've said that um, when you get an intake, uh, you'll receive dose from that uh, internal contamination for as long as it stays in the body. And in internal dosimetry, we define uh, a committed equivalent dose, which is the the dose received by an organ over the 50 years following intake. Now, for short-lived things, I mean, almost all that dose will be crude within the first weeks, months or year or so, in the case of tritium, probably in the first few months. On the other hand, things like plutonium will go on, will may well be retained in the body for many years. But any, whichever way you do it, you, you have to integrate the, the dose rate over 50 years following intake to get the committed equivalent dose. If you then weight all these um, organ committed equivalent doses by the tissue weighting factor, um, you then end up with a quantity called the committed effective dose. And for example, for the case of um, plutonium moderately soluble plate plutonium 239 uh, one becquerel of, of intake via inhalation gives you a committed effective dose of 3.2 by 10 to the minus 5 sieverts or 32 micro sieverts uh, there are also a couple of derived quantities that are widely used in internal dosimetry there's the annual limit of intake which is simply the intake needed to give you a committed effective dose of 20 millisieverts. And for moderately soluble plate, that would be about 600 becquerels, roughly speaking. And the second quantity is the derived air concentration. And that air concentration for any given nuclei is the intake which if you work in it for a working year, which is usually assumed to be 2000 hours, you will breathe in one annual limit of intake. That is to say your committed dose will be 20 millisieverts. And for plutonium-239 again, that would be the derived air concentration is about 0.26 becquerels per meter cubed. So if you're working in a, in a workplace where you have air, airborne contamination at that level, and if you work there for a year, you would get um, an intake of one ALI and therefore a dose of 20 millisieverts. So at this point, I'd like to explore in a bit more detail about how you calculate an internal dose. You need to know basically two different things. For any given organ, you need to know how many radioactive decays are going to occur whilst the nuclide is retained in the organ. Uh, and that's going to depend both on the radiological half-life, but also on the biological clearance rate. Um, we'll be looking at tritium in a minute, and the, the radioactive half-life is uh, approximately 12 years. But the biological clearance time, well, the bulk of it is removed in 10, in, with a half-time of about 10 days. So for something like tritium, it's the biological clearance that determines how quickly the stuff goes away. The radioactive half-life becomes almost irrelevant, but that wouldn't be true for some of the short-lived or short-lived nuclides. This information about how many, how long these 
material is retained in an organ um, and therefore how many decays occur while it, it's in the organ. This information is provided by what are called biokinetic models. These are models which try to represent how the various processes which clear radioactive materials from an organ and from the whole body. Um, and the other thing we need, obviously, is there's some nuclear physics information. We need to know about the decay of the nuclide and how much energy is released and in what form. Now, let's have a look at how one of the calculation like this might proceed for the simple ca case of tritiated water. Now, tritium is a particularly simple case because it's believed to, to distribute fairly uniformly through the body water and therefore uniformly through the, the whole body. And this greatly simplifies the calculation. Um, for example, it means that the, in the terminology of internal dosimetry, the organ where the uh, activity is located is called the source organ. And the organ where you're trying to calculate the dose for is called the target organ. Um, and these may or may not be the same organ. But for tritium, then that the organ of concern is essentially the whole body, and that serves as both the, the source organ and the target organ. So that's one simplification. Um, whereas some um, nuclides have a very complicated um, clearance pattern, in with tritium, it's really quite simple. Ninety-seven, according to the current model, um, the model described in ICRP fifty-six, I think it is. 90% uh, of tritium is um, is retained with a biological half time of 10 days. And then there's a small portion which is believed to be organically bound, which is cleared more slowly with a half time of 40 days. And as far as tritium is concerned, that's all we need to know about biokinetics. So we don't need any wrong complicated model as that's all we need to know. So this is the decay of uh, Tritium, basically, a, a tritium consi consists of a, it's a hydrogen nucleus, um, but whereas the usual, usual hydrogen nucleus has got just one proton, uh, tritium has got one proton and two neutrons. And that decays into helium-3 uh, with the release of a neutron and an and a electron or a beta particle. Um, but the underlying uh, reaction is the decay of one of the neutrons to a proton, or at an even more fundamental level, one of the bottom quarks in a neutron becomes an up quark and turns the neutron into a proton. But that, I'm not going to go into any more nuclear physics than that. OK, decay properties. Radioactive decay half-life is 12.3 years. The total decay. K energy is 18.6 keV, kilo electron volts, and the average beta energy is 5.7 keV. And then you may want to, uh, if you want something to do over the next few slides, you might try to figure out why if the total K energy is 8.6 keV, the beta particle on average only comes away with 5.7 keV. Now, as I said before, the radioactive half-life is much longer than the biological half-life. So as far as clearance from the body is concerned, we can forget about the radioactive half-life and just concentration on the biological half-life. Now, a simple bit of maths, and you've seen the question there, and if you want to do go through this maths, it might provide an amusing exercise this afternoon if you've got nothing better to do. Um, number of decays, in a, if you have some compartment, be it the whole body in the case of tritium, with a given half time, biological half clearance time, um, then the total number of decays, if you integrate out to in 50 years, is the activity at the beginning multiplied by the biological half life divided by the natural logarithm of two. Uh, and you can do a little bit of maths and figure out why it comes to be that. You need to tidy up the units and convert half-life to seconds in order to get the units right because an activity is inverse seconds. Uh, for tritium, we need to do two of those calculations. We allow, have to allow for the 0.97 becquerels with a half-time clearance half-time of 10 days, 
and then we have to do a calculation for the other 0 0.083 Becker L's for the half time of 40 days. And if you do this little bit of fairly simple maths, you end up that the total number of decays per Becker L of intake over 50 years is about 1.38 by 10 to the 6. So for every Becker L of intake, we've got 1.38 by 10 to the 6 decays, each depositing 5.7 kV on average. And if you do a little bit more arithmetic, you'll find that this corresponds to 1.26 by 10 to the minus 9 joules per Becker L. Now we have to divide by 70 the ICRP, ICRP 23 standard man, which is what we're still working to for regulatory purposes in the UK. And if you do that, you get that, that the absorbed dose per Becker L of intake is 1.8 by 10 to the minus 11. And the final bit of the calculation is you have to allow for the radiation weighting factor. But that's simple in this case because they're beta particles and they have a, um, a weighting factor of one. So you end up with a committed effective dose per Becker L of 1.8 by 10 to the minus 11 um, sieverts per Becker L, which in fact is the right answer. That's what you'll find, I think. I haven't actually got any ICRP documents at home with me, but that's the uh, the dose factor for tritiated water. Um, and you might, at the end of that, say, if we can do it that simply, why do we need the ICRP? But I think it, it, I need to emphasise that other nuclides aren't as simple as that. Okay, so we've had a look at a sim the breakdown, really, of a simple internal dose calculation. Now I'm going to move on and look briefly at the monitoring methods that, um, that I mentioned earlier. The first method is air, air monitoring, air sampling. You can have either installed or static air samplers, as they're, various call, they're variously called, and they have high flow rates. Um, they usually have fixed sampling locations, they may have some alarm system which gives you a warning if the air, airborne concentration gets too high. Um, you do need to um, you need to know the activity in the area where the person is working and record how much time he spends there if you're going to use these to work out an intake. You don't have this problem if you have personal air samplers because the worker actually work, wears it on his lapel close to his breathing zone um while he's doing the work so the activity is um is directly related to the individual worker the sensitivity is good you can measure intakes even for actinides and well below a millisievert and there's a direct relationship between the activity and the time of intake you know when the guy is wearing this air sample but and it's quite a big but you have to be aware that whatever activity that you measure on the personal air sampler or the static air sampler is material that has not been breathed. By definition, it's stuff that got captured by the, the air sample, sampling head, and it's not what the guy breathed in. And you have to worry about how closely related the PAS activity is to the actual intake. Um, dose assessment from PAS results is, is very simple. Um, you measure the activity on the filter that's contained within the sampling head. Um, you scale it up by the ratio of a typical breathing, breathing rate for a person, the ratio of that breathing rate to the sampling rate of the PAS, because obviously the, the, the more air you take in, the bigger intake you're going to get. That gives you the intake and then you multiply by the dose factor to get the dose. Or you can do calculations, practical calculations based on um, um, the DAC hours. But I, I personally, I always prefer to go back to um, activity and Becker L. Now comes the warning. Um, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in air sampling, particularly in personal air samplers. So I don't want to overemphasize what's in this um, graph. But some years ago, I did a survey of cases where we had 
a known incident where we had a PAS result and where we also had follow-up um, urine and faecal sampling. So I could use the usual modelling techniques that internal dosimeters use to estimate the intake. And I could compare it with the intake um, based on the personal air sampler. And I had a feeling that the, co the correlation might be rather poor, but what I didn't expect was the correlation would be almost zero. Um, and as you can see from this graph, is basically the points are scattered more or less over the entire graph. If you put PAS intake in terms of Becquerel against the CES intake in Becquerel. Now you have to bear in mind that firstly, the both the PAS and the assessed intake will have large uncertainties. The other thing is you have to bear in mind that whilst the PAS might, as you can see from this graph, not give you a very accurate estimate of um, individual intakes, if you, once you start averaging over longer periods of time, for example, a working year, then I would expect that you do start to get um, a rather better correlation between personal air samplers and assessed intakes. So don't throw away the PAS, I believe it's a valuable tool, but you do need to bear in the back of your mind, they have their limitations. Okay, in vivo monitoring. There you're actually measuring the activity after it's got into the body. You can, you, for whole body monitoring, for example, a person might lie on under an array of um, scintillation detectors, sodium iodide detectors, for example. Um, or you can actually concentrate on measuring specific parts of the body, like the lung and the liver. In vivo monitoring is, is excellent. In fact, I'd say it, it's the primary method for which I'd ever want to do monitoring for things like cesium-137, for activation products like cobalt-60. Uh, it's an excellent means of determining quite small intakes or very, very small doses potential doses using that method. It becomes less good when you've got alpha emitters. The, the plutonium-239 does emit X-rays, um, but they're very low energy. They're very difficult to detect. Um, americium 241 is a bit better because it emits a 60 keV line, which you can measure. Um, but for Plute 239, it's really pushing it a bit to try and detect it in, in vivo using um, external photon detectors. So unless you have material where you have a really well-known ratio of Plute to americium, you're not really going to get a sensible result, in my opinion, for plutonium using in vivo monitoring. And so we move on to the final method, which is in vitro monitoring, as it's sometimes called, or bioassay. Um, and people then, your, your work will then provide either urine sample or faecal sample. Um, the urine sampling tends to be related to the amount of activity that's been absorbed into the bloodstream and then taken up by various body organs. Uh, faecal sampling gives you an idea of the, of the activity that's cleared from the lung and comes down through the gut. Um, it tends to, the, the two methods in a sense are somewhat complementary. For example, you look at plutonium. Um, for, for more soluble compounds of plutonium, again, we're talk, talking throughout here by in, inhalation. Um, the soluble plutonium, urine, it, it is, a, it's a pretty good method for monitoring and fecal sampling is, is much less good. But if you get to highly insoluble compounds, it tends to switch around and then your urine sample becomes less, much less sensitive and a faecal sample starts to become more useful. Um, these are a few detection limits um, for various methods. You can detect below a Becquerel using a PAS. Um, actinides in urine, you can certainly get down to 0 0.2 of a millibecquerel in a 24 hour sample, urine sample. Uh, americium in long, probably the order of a, a few up to 10 becquerels is your lower limit. Uranium in urine, a better millibecquerels, for example. And then 
actinides and uranium in feces, a couple of millibacterials. But these are actually pretty meaningless unless you know what intake they correspond to, and that's where your mathematical modeling comes in. So that's a quick overview there. Static air sampling, very cost effective, high sampling rates. You get coverage for the whole plant. It's good for looking at the um, conditions in a plant, particularly over a period of time, and you can get for changes in overall air concentration that would, might indicate some breakdown in control of your activity. Um, but you have to bear in mind that it's the, the relationship between a static air sample and a uh, and an actual intake might for an individual intake might be rather poor. Um, personal air sampler at least has a direct relation to the work, uh, so you've no need for occupancy data. It's sensitive method, simple method of analysis, no mathematical modeling, biokinetic modeling is needed. Um, but as we mentioned, I mentioned before that you have to worry a little bit about for individual intakes what the relationship is between your PAS result and your actual intake. Um, urine sampling again is directly related to the worker, um, but you need some relatively complex, particularly for actinides, a complex bio um, bioassay analysis, um, and also you have this problem for routine monitoring that if, for example, somebody gives a positive urine uh, in a quarterly urine sample, you're then worried about, unless you have some other indication of when the intake was, all you, you, you have to worry about the, when, when did the intake occur, because that's going to drastically af affect the relationship between what you measure in urine and what was the intake. Whole body monitoring gives a nice directive idea of intake requires some fairly expensive equipment and it's only really got a good um, sensitivity for, for gamma emitters. OK, so we saw that at least the two of those methods relied on mathematical models in order to relate um, what is retained or what is excreted from the body with what went in in the first place. Um, and we basically need two sorts of models, which I've already talked about in relation to that simple example, tritium. Um, but you need dosimetric models, um, which, which allow you to calculate the dose to organ B arising from activity in organ A. So, for example, in the case of a gamma emitter, you'll need some kind of effectively gamma transport code that enables you to relate how much of the gamma, how many of the gamma rays emitted from and the activity in organ A that actually reach organ B. So you need to know in detail the geometry of the body and so on and so forth. You also need biokinetic models, as I've mentioned earlier, which allow you to calculate how many decays occur in the in an organ or in the whole body as a function of time after intake. Um, and just to emphasize yet again, um, not all the models are as simple as tritium. This, gives a, this diagram gives a, firstly, it's not kind of schematic for the sorts of modeling you have to take, in, take into account. If you have intake by inhalation, for example, then the, uh, the material, first of all, ends up in the respiratory tract. Um, it then gets um, taken up by the so-called transfer compartment, the body fluids in effect via absorption across the alveoli deep in the lung. And from there, it can go to various other organs. Or, and then ultimately also to urine. Whereas mucociliary reaction can transport material up the respiratory tract and then down the gut where it emerges as, as feces. For a wound, then you get material coming into subcutaneous tissue, it also could get directly absorbed into the bloodstream, and then once again it distributes through different organs. Uh, ingestion to get, get the material goes straight into the, the gut, and then um, a lot of it will come out in feces, some of it will get taken up uh, again into body fluids. Um, this is a representation of the recipe system and how it's split up into different compartments uh, for the purpose of, of the ICRP lung model. You've got extra, the so-called extra thoracic regions, which include the um, 
um, the, the, the nose, the mouth, the pharynx. And then you've got the thoracic region where the uh, trachea starts to split up into different um, bronch um, bronchi. And then right down at the bottom, the, the bronchioles, the, the smaller um, divisions, then ultimately end up in the alveoli, which is where transport across the walls of the alveoli transfer material into the bloodstream. So this business of, of creating biokinetic models um, for the body as a whole and for the different components of the body, it can be quite a complex business. As I've, I've mentioned before, uh, the insulation is the most usual route in um, occupational situations. And material that's inhaled ends up initially in the lung from which it's cleared by two processes. There's particle transport, where particles are transferred up, third up the, the uh, respiratory system and down through the gut. And then there's dissolution of particles where material gets ultimately broken up and dissolved and transferred to body fluids. And it turns out that the rate of clearance via dissolution is very dependent on the solubility of the compound, or to be specific, solubility of the compound in, in lung fluids. Some materials like uranium hexafluoride are very soluble, some like plutonium nitrates are moderately soluble, and some like high fibre plute oxides are very insoluble. And in the terminology of internal dose symmetry, these different sorts of compounds are, type, uh, are labelled type F, type M and type S, where the F stands for fast, the M for medium and S for slow according to how, roughly speaking, how, um, how quickly or slowly these materials are cleared from the lung via dissolution. Um, and these solubilities have a big effect on how the material is cleared, how much dose is received by different bits of the body, and how much you're going to see in urine and feces. Um, and in, when we model um, the, the, in the biokinetic modelling, we have to give different clearance parameters to uh, these different sorts of compound. Once you've done all your various calculations, you can um, calculate these quantities that I mentioned much earlier, and that's annual limits of intake. Uh, and these are all for inhalation. So um, for things like Plutonium, moderately soluble plutonium um, for the actinides, you've got annual limits of intake of around between six and 700 becquerels, very roughly. Or oh, for uranium 238, the um, annual limit of intake is much higher, it's about 12,500 12, Um For less soluble materials, the, um, the annual limit of intake is larger which is a way of saying that the, the, the dose per unit intake is smaller. So these are overall less hazardous than the um, moderately soluble compounds. And that's despite the fact that they actually will give, probably give a, dip, a bigger dose to the lung, but much less is taken up across the body fluids and gets absorbed in the other organs. So overall, you find that the type S compounds produce less dose per becquerel than the type M compound. Um, and for type S compounds of, of actinides, um, of, of the higher actinides like plutonium and americium, your ALIs of the order of two a couple of thousand, and that is a bit larger than for uranium-238. You can also use your mathematical models to calculate excretion and retention curves, which is, of course, what you need if you're going to interpret in vivo monitoring or excretion monitoring. This is type M, mod, well, that's the same, moderately soluble PLUT239. Um, and you can see that the, the, the signal, the amount of activity coming out in feces is a lot higher than it is uh, in urine. Um, Although you also have to bear in mind that the limit, that the detection limit for the bioassay of fecal samples is a better order of magnitude worse than it is for uranium, so, sorry, for urine. So it's not quite, the picture isn't quite as rosy. 
But if you look carefully at that graph, you'll see in the early stages, the fecal activity is about two and a bit orders of magnitude higher than the urine activity. If you go to type S, you'll see the difference is much greater. Now the fecal activity is at one, two, three, four, nearly five orders of magnitude higher for the fecal activity than for the urine activity. And this ties in with what I said earlier, that for type S compounds, fecal sampling starts to become more effective than urine sampling. For type M compounds, it switches over the other way. And the, the basic reason is the, the for that is these excretion curves. OK, so that's enough of the, the formal stuff for the time being. Let's go back to our old friend tritium. Now, tritium is usually monitored by urine sampling. Um, so how are we going to interpret a urine result? Now, we've, we've actually done on most of the work as we already know what the biokinetics are, as we had to use them for calculating the dose. Tritiated water distributes evenly through the body water. So in effect, a urine sample is just a sample of this body water. And the activity per litre in the urine is equal, gives you a kind of snapshot of what the activity per litre in body water is on the voiding. And that model I described earlier, where 97% of the activity is retained for 10 days and 3%, oh, I just noticed that there's zero too many. And <laughs> you always notice the mistakes in a slide when you start giving the talk. That should be 0 0.03, not 0 0.003. At any rate, a smaller quantity is cleared with a half-life of 40 days. And that equation is simply a mathematical representation of, that, of those biokinetic facts. Uh, to get from act total activity to Becquerel's per litre, we have to divide by 42. Uh, not because it's the answer to life, the universe and everything, but because it's the number of body of uh, litres of body water, uh, of, of, flu of water in the, in the human body, according to ICRP 23. So armed with that information, we can model the activity concentration in urine as a function of time after intake. And we can easily plot out a nice little graph Becquerel's per litre in urine against days after intake, and we see this nice smooth curve. And if we want to, if we get a urine sample at some time after intake, we can simply read off from this graph how many Becquerel's per litre we'd expect for, for a one Becquerel intake, and we can then scale it up to find out how many Becquerel's the intake actually was. So suppose we um, five days after an intake, we take a urine sample and we measure 10 kilobecquerels per litre in urine. If we were to go back to that graph, well, let's go back to it. five days after intake. Uh, if you interpolate from that graph a bit, you can see that the, for one for one becquerel of intake, you've got about 0 0.017 uh, becquerels per litre. Um, so divide that into 10,000 becquerels, which is what we actually measure, and you get an intake of 5.9 by 10 to 5 becquerels. Now you mul simply multiply by the number we calculated earlier, the 1.8 by 10 to minus 11 sieverts per becquerel, and then you get a dose of 1.06 by 10 to minus 5 sieverts, which is 10.6 microsieverts. So you've got your urine sample, you've measured it, uh, you've measured the activity in it, and a very simple calculation gives you the dose. So that's a simple example of how you'd use one of these excreting curves to calculate an intake and then using the dose factor to get a dose. Right, next topic is how do you decide what sort of monitoring regime you're going to use? Now, uh, in the UK, the HSC requirements for approval of dosimetry services are required that um, the monitoring you use should be able to get down to doses of one millisievert per year. And also that the you shouldn't underest 
this whatever procedure you use shouldn't underestimate the true dose by more than a factor of three and also un avoid undue pessimism. And the other requirement is the extent of the monitoring program and the effort required should be proportional to the actual exposures or, or risk of exposure. So basically, you don't want to throw the kitchen sink at some situation where you're only going to get doses of less than a microsieber per year. You have to use a bit of common sense in designing these uh, monitoring regimes. There are various different sorts of, of monitoring. Um, you can have what's called assessment monitoring, where you actually use the bioassay regime. Oops. You actually use the bioassay regime. Um, to do to directly measure the dose, and that's what we do usually for, for tritium. Um, but we don't tend to use bioassay regimes usually to directly measure, say, actinide doses. Um, what we normally have is some sort of method like personal air samplers, and then we have um, the the bioassay regime acts as a kind of backup to make sure that we haven't missed any significant intakes. And that's called reassurance monitoring. And that requires, because it's not the, the first line of defense, that requ only requires you to get down to six millisieverts. You can have operational monitoring, which is designed to measure doses for a specific operation, usually a relatively short duration to see whether any significant intakes have occurred. Um, and you can have investigative monitoring. So if, you, if you're working in an actinide area, you get a high PAS, then you'll normally follow up with urine and fecal sampling and try and calculate, get another estimate of the dose based on bioassay, and that's called investigative monitoring. All right, so once again, we're going to return to our friend Tritium, and we're going to use a urine monitoring program which is going to be used for assessment purposes. So as I said just previously, that means we need to get down to annual doses of one millisievert per year. So let's suppose we decide we're going to try a, a monthly year, uh, urine sample program. Um, we need to figure out is that going to do the job for us? Is that going to get us down to a millisievert per year? Um, so if you go back to that, that, that graph that I showed earlier and do a bit of interpolation, you, you find that if you have a, a monthly monitoring, and if you have an intake at, in, in the middle of that period, um, that will produce an activity per litre of 0 0.0087 Becquerel's per litre. Now, the typical reporting level for tritium in urine is, a, is often 100 becquerels per litre. It'll vary from one lab to another, but that's a fairly usual figure. So this midpoint intake, if you divide that 100 by your 0 0.07, 0, 0, 0, 0.087, you'll get an intake of 11.5 kilobecquerels for that one monitoring interval. And that corresponds to 0.21 microsieverts. Now you have to multiply up by the number of monitoring periods, which is obviously 12 for monthly monitoring, and you find you can count, you can uh, detect doses of um, 12, sorry, 2.5 microsieverts per year. So that's well within the millisievert. So you'd say that's probably going to be a, bit, a perfectly adequate means of monitoring. Um, however, for the purpose of evaluating the the um, the re monitoring regime, we've used intakes at, um, at the midpoint of each monitoring interval. Suppose they actually occur at the beginning of each monitoring interval. I mean, you'd be pretty unlucky if this happened, but you have to at least consider it. And if you go through the same calculation again, uh, you, again, you look at the graph, you find that now you would get your sample you would get 0 0.0033 becquerels per litre. And your single urine would give you a dose of 6.5 microsieverts um, annually. Sorry, that your monitoring regime would give you 6.5 microsieverts annually, which is a, less than a factor of three greater than the 2.5 microsieverts. So your underestimate factor is less than three. 
and so once again you conclude that this monthly monitoring regime would be acceptable. So a mon monthly monitoring, um, urine monitoring for tritium is perfectly acceptable, but there's nothing to stop you using more frequent monitoring. I mean, you may, the, cust the person or the, um, the, the company involved in this particular process might decide they want more frequent monitoring, um, for example, for control purposes. There's nothing to prevent you in the regulation doing monitoring as often as you as you like. But what this calculation shows that as far as detecting annual doses of better than a, a millisievert per year, monthly monitoring would be perfectly adequate. Another topic which I think that doesn't get enough attention because it's difficult to turn into a mathematical model is what, when do you need internal dosimetry monitoring? Um, you need to consider various, this is difficult to quantify, but there are various things you need to take into account. One is the type of nuclides you're dealing with, for example, PLUT239, 238, and Mauritium 241 all have relatively low annual limits of intake. They're hazardous materials. They're obviously a different matter, for example, from tritium, which has a much lower dose per unit intake. You have to consider the, um, the physical form. Um, is it solid? Is it liquid? Is it vapor? Um, because that's going to affect how well you can control the material. What sort of work are you doing? Are you doing wet chemistry, handling waste drums? Are you working in a dust, dusty environment? Are you administering radiopharmaceuticals? And what's the work environment like? Are you using a fume hood, open bench, glove box? Um, so there are all these factors to take into account, but they're difficult to quantify and you know, in time figure out what sort of dose a person might get. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It actually, I think, in my opinion, deserves a talk all on its own. Um, but the, there is, for example, an, I, an algorithm thought up by the IAEA, which t attempts to quantify this sort of thinking. Um, and you, you calculate a decision level D. And if D is greater than one, you decide that monitoring is, is necessary. And the criterion for calculating this D is that you, E of one is equivalent to getting a do an annual dose of a millisievert. They come out with this physical form factor, which is 0 0.01, which they seem to pluck from midair without any great justification. I'm not I'm quite sure where it comes from. Um, but there's a protection safety factor, which is small if you've got a, something like a glove box or a fume hood, which is one if you've got an open bench, because of basically there is no safety factor involved. You've got a handling safety factor, which will depend on the on the um, on the, the, whether you've got dry, dusty conditions, or whether you're dealing with a fairly intact solid source, or with liquids, or whatever. And for dry, dusty conditions, it's a hundred, and then you have to feed in uh, the dose coefficient. So I'm doing a calculation here for a kilobecquerel of americium nitrate, for which the dose coefficient is 2.7 by 10 to the minus 5 sieverts per becker arm. And if you put all these rather dodgy numbers together and multiply them together, you come out with 27. And since that's a big, a great deal um, greater than one, you would conclude that you do need a monitoring program for this sort of work. Um, whilst all the dim numbers that go into this are fairly um, dubious, I, I think that at least this algorithm does help you to focus on the things you have to take into account when deciding whether you use monitoring or not. Right, so that's a, a brief run through internal dose symmetry, but to finish off, I want to talk very briefly about what changes are going to occur when the new um, OIRs come in, the operational intakes of radionuclides that um, have been published by the um, ICRP recently because um, the models that we use to calculate doses and to calculate excretion and retention have now changed and the bad news is they've got even more complicated. Um, 
we've got revisions to the old ICRP lung model. We've got new dosimetry that's based on the, the voxel phantoms, which have a more accurate description of the geometry of the different organs within the body. You've got new systemic models. Uh, all of these are going to feed through into our calculations of dose factors and retention and excretion. So let's have a look first of all of dose factors and um, ALIs. I put the um, for these are all for plutonium. We've got the three default solubilities types F, M, and S, um, which are all of the order of 10 to the minus 5 in the OIRs. A, a big change is that now, in addition to default uh, dose coefficients, they're also providing specific dose coefficients for some of the better studied compounds. So now, so whereas before uh, OIRs, flute nitrate was simply regarded as type M. They've now come up with a specific set of parameters for um, plutonium nitrate, which differs very slightly from type M. And also they've come up with parameters for plutonium dioxide. The ALIs are listed in the, uh, the third column. That's again for the o OIRs. We can, we can compare those with the ALIs that we've got currently based on what we would find, for example, if you use the those factors in ICRP 68. And you'll see that type M um, and plutonium 239 or plutonium 239 nitrate, the ALIs have gone up, which is to say that the, the dose per unit intake is now smaller. Um, so that's good news. Uh, on the other hand, for plut dioxide, the situation uh, has got worse. The now got a lower ALI by a factor of three than in ICRP 68, which means that according to the new modeling, plute dioxide is now more hazardous per becquerel than it was thought to be. A look at americium, um, we've got, um, once again, that we got the default categories, we've got now a specific uh, dose per unit intake for americium nitrate, we can calculate ALIs from those figures. Type M, um, the ALI has gone up. Um, and also for nitrate, type S, there is no equivalent figure because in the ICRP 68 system, there weren't supposed to be any type S um, compounds or americium. But now it's, I think, and I, I welcome this particular step, it's now admitted. I, I think been accepted by ICRP that um, americium, whilst pure americium compounds probably never are that insoluble. In reality, in the workplace, you often don't get pure compounds as an aerosol. What you get is mixtures. And if you get some americium hitching a ride on a plutonium oxide particle, which is highly insoluble, then the americium itself is going to be carried along with the, with the dissolution of the plutonium oxide, which means it will have, in effect, type S solubility forced upon it. And I think that's a, a real practical situation, and I'm, I'm quite glad that um, the ICRP have, have taken that into account. Uh, tritium, very little change. Um, Tritiated water, we've, we've done the calculation um, for the uh, ALI um, or for the dose factor. It used to be 1.8 by 10 to minus 11. Now it's 2 by 10 to minus 11. The ALI has changed from, is now uh, 10, to nine, 10 to the power 9 becquerels, where it used to be 1.1 by 10 to 9. Not much change there at all with, um, with uh, Tritium gas, um, and but there's net, whereas before tritium was always re regarded as a vapor, now they um, have admitted the possibility that organically bound tritium could be appear in the, in the form of aerosol particles, and they've come up with a dose factor and ALI for that. Uh, strontium ninety, um, 
ALI thought type F hasn't changed much. There was no type M before, but now we've got a type M value. The type S factor has changed, it's come down. The ALI has come down by a factor of 2.6. Excretion curves, we've already calculated the excretion curve for tritiated water earlier in this presentation and the ICRP, um, the OIR value is essentially the same. I'm not quite sure those little bumps I think are sort of rounding approximations but um, essentially there's no difference. This is the one that surprised me. When I've now I've plotted on this graph the current excretion curve for type M plute 239 um, and I put the OIR excretion curve in and if you look right at the beginning whereas the old curve dropped monotonically in the early days after intake now we've got this rise it starts off low and then it goes up I have to say in Harwell cases I've never seen any evidence for this but um, that I think needs a little bit of thinking about it and we've got something rather similar going on with, with um, type S under the old models a monotonic decrease at least into dis in, up until you get to a few hundred days and then you get a slow rise then a drop again with the OIR models you get a rise then a drop and then a slight rise again and then a drop um, and you'll see that the curves are quite at the times quite separated so the interpretation of urine activities for plutonium will change with the new OIR models. So that concludes the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh